Hello and welcome to uh, Co-Founder Chats. My name is Ryan Correa, and I'm joined today by my co-founder and in-house expert, Alexander Morsink. Hi. We run Equivesto, a Canadian online investment portal, and today we're discussing funds. Okay, getting right into it. Alex, what is a fund? So a fund essentially is a investment vehicle where a whole bunch of people get together, pool their money, and then that money is then used to make a number of different investments. The idea is rather than investing separately and trying to make multiple smaller investments with your own money by grouping together in a, in a large coordinated effort, you can invest more money overall, but still split that into more different investments. So that allows you to diversify your smaller investment further and it puts your money in the control of someone who is typically an expert in the space and might be able to make better choices with regards to the investment or the direction uh, than you could access on your own. Excellent. And what are funds used for? Funds are really used for diversification where, you know, if you only have a thousand dollars or five thousand dollars to invest, you can't invest, for example, in all 500 uh, companies in the S&P 500, the largest 500 companies in the U.S. Uh, stock market. But by investing in the S&P 500, that fund invests in all of them. So then you would gain access to all of those. The other benefit is having you know individuals who are experts hired by that fund running that fund, be able to make those choices for you. An example for that would be if you're interested in investing in early stage companies, uh, private companies, you might not have the personal network to give you access to all the different personal companies, uh, smaller companies and private companies that you want to invest into. But by investing into a private VC fund, that fund has built that expertise to find and select the best companies to invest in and invest that way. So you're really investing in the fund to gain access to expertise greater than your own and to diversify your investments uh, in, in ways that you couldn't with your own funds. Makes sense. What are uh, what are some common types of funds? There's a whole different range of, of funds, um, both public and private ones, starting with sort of public funds, really famous, the sort of broadest category of funds would be mutual funds. So uh, these are funds that are regulated and organized. You're investing in a pool with a number of other people. And then based on the, the objectives of the fund, the fund manager is then going out and finding investments for it. Uh, typically, mutual funds, uh, publicly available mutual funds, invest into public investments, whether that's stocks or bonds. You also have other public funds like uh, EFTs or index funds, and you have some private funds that people may have heard of, like a hedge fund uh, or a venture capital fund, and you also have uh, real estate-based funds as well. Going into a little bit further detail, what is a mutual fund? Yeah, so a mutual fund is uh, really the broadest category, so it's not necessarily describing one type of investment or another. It's essentially just saying the idea that a bunch of people are pooling their money together mutually, and then it's being managed by one person. Now, if you walk into a bank and you're looking to invest in mutual funds, typically those are publicly available, open-ended mutual funds. And so what that means is those funds are publicly traded. They're being traded on the stock market all the time. And they're open-ended, which means that you as the investor can buy and sell those anytime, but also get your money back out from the fund and what's called redeem or uh, exercise a redemption and, and have the fund buy back your units uh, anytime. When you invest into a fund, you don't get shares, you get units. And so you can leave your investment in the fund by either selling your units to another investor on the stock market or by taking those units directly to the fund itself and saying, hey, can you please buy my units back? And that's called a redemption. You can sort of exit it in one of those two ways. Uh, and public mutual funds are all open-ended, which means redemptions are allowed anytime. Now, mutual funds uh, 
you typically can't buy them a standard mutual fund. You can't buy them directly. You have to purchase those through uh, a mutual fund dealer and they are regulated in Canada. So people have to have a, a license to be able to deal in mutual funds and therefore give advice to investors around, you know, what mutual funds might be best for you. And when you go to the bank and you sit down with your financial advisor, pretty much 99.9% .9 of them all would also be mutual fund dealers. So they would be the people who'd be able to sell that mutual fund to you. And Mutual funds, uh, publicly available ones, are typically focused in a few categories. Mutual funds typically invest only in other public investments. So that's stocks of companies and also bonds or debt of those same companies or governments. And then you can look at mutual funds that are investing locally in Canada itself, in the United States, or in the North American market. Or you can look at mutual funds investing in different other global regions like Europe, like Asia, maybe China specifically, or Japan, or emerging markets, South America. Um, you know, there's a whole different range that way. So when you're choosing your mutual funds, you can choose really general ones that just kind of invest in everything, a little bit of everything. You can choose mutual funds that invest in specific regions. You can also choose mutual funds that invest in only the stocks of other companies or only the bonds, the debt of other companies or a combination of both. And finally, you can choose mutual funds that just invest into other funds themselves. Those are called funds of funds. So there's a lot of variety. Every bank has I'm sure uh, dozens, if not hundreds of different options that they all offer. And some of them are really similar. When making the choice between mutual funds, you would want to speak to your advisor and just think about from your perspective, what your kind of goals are. Typically, if you want less risk, but therefore lower returns, you're going to look for mutual funds that focus on the debts of larger, more established companies. If you're looking for higher potential returns, that also comes with higher risk. And then you might be looking to invest mostly in stocks of companies and potentially those in more emerging markets, depending on the current sort of global economic trend. If you're looking to invest in something that is sort of a whole mix of everything and it's going to kind of keep you safe. You know, the, the gold standard for most uh, investment managers is simply investing in a mutual fund that covers the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 is Standard & Poor's list of the 500 largest public companies in America. And so if you invest in the S&P 500, you're investing in the 500 biggest companies in America, which is essentially investing in a stand-in for the entire American stock market. And the S&P 500 has, on average, over its lifetime, over you know, 80, 90 years, returned somewhere between sort of 8 and 11%. So it's often seen as a good choice as sort of a set it and forget it option. Um, but there's a whole range of, of different mutual funds that are available. But that's a quick rundown of public open-ended mutual funds. Excellent. And, and expanding on that question, um, who determines the asset mix uh, for these different um, you know, mutual funds that people invest in. So when people invest in more stocks or invest in more bonds, who's who's creating those that list essentially that these banks offer us? That's a great question, Ryan. So the mix of the fund, what it invests in and in what quantities is determined when the fund itself is structured. The fund in its founding documents, the limited partnership agreement and a number of other things like that, actually declare all the parameters within which the fund managers are allowed to make investment choices. And so you, as an investor, can know based on these documents, okay, what are they allowed to do? What are they not allowed to do? Most public you know, open-ended mutual funds do not allow their fund managers to invest into 
private companies like startups or, you know, engage in high risk things like options trading or other types of derivatives trading. You know, they're not allowed to go out and make kind of crazy bets with your money. They're designed to be kind of constrained to something that is generating less returns, but is also less risk. So it's more sort of consistent and straightforward. I would also like to talk briefly about how funds actually work. How are they created? So what is a fund itself? We know that companies are typically corporations, which means, you know, somebody's gone out and incorporated them and corporations are their own distinct legal entity um, registered with the government. Funds are typically structured as something called limited partnerships. Limited partnerships are a, a type of partnership, and they're a little bit different than a corporation. With a limited partnership, essentially, people are buying units in the limited partnership, and the investors into a limited partnership are limited partners. They're buying LP, limited partner, units. Limited partners have limited liability and limited exposure to the decisions being made by the fund as, you know, what to do with the money and how it's structured and everything like that. Essentially, the limited partners are silent investors. They put the money in, they can lose the money that they put in, but they can't lose anything more than that. And, you know, somebody else goes off and manages it. The other type of partner is the general partner. And the general partner is the individual or the group that's actually going out and making decisions for the fund itself. They're responsible for everything the fund does, and their responsibility isn't limited to any money that they've invested into the fund. It extends to anything that the fund does, and they're responsible for sort of choosing what goes on with the money. So they typically are minority owners, they've put in much less money than all the limited partners, but they have full control. Now, because that liability is unlimited um, for the general partners, typically a person is not a general partner when a fund is structured. Typically, a numbered corporation is set up, and then that numbered corporation is the general partner because corporations limit the liability. Then the directors of that numbered corporation would be the individuals who are actually sort of making the decisions regarding the fund. Now, with public funds, typically the general partner of the fund who sets it up isn't actually the person who makes the decisions about the investments. The general partner will often hire a fund manager or a fund management company to make those choices. Whereas with private funds, typically the general partner is also the person managing the fund just because it's less expensive. Um, and so the person setting it up is usually the person who's also planning to run it. With large organizations, for example, if you look at Scotiabank or RBC or TD, where they have thousands and thousands of funds, you know, the general partner is going to be that numbered company, but then that numbered company is going to be owned by somehow all the way up the chain, you know, Scotiabank Asset Management and eventually Scotiabank. And Scotiabank is going to have a different company specifically for training people to manage funds called, you know, Scotiabank Asset Management or something like that. And then each of the individual funds would hire Scotiabank Asset Management to provide a fund manager to actually manage the fund, and that would be different than the general partner. So it depends on how that's how that's all set up. But if your fund has a fund manager, then of course that person is the person managing the fund, but they are not necessarily also the general partner. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, talking about other types of, of public funds, what's an index fund? So I actually accidentally gave an example of an index fund earlier. Let's describe first what an index is. So an index is essentially a collection of information kind of summarizing the, the group that it's taken from. So if you think about um, the US stock market and, and the, the hundreds of thousands of companies in the US stock market, there are these indexes that exist to sort of measure 
the U.S. stock market, sort of how it's doing, sort of take a take a test, a, a litmus test to see, OK, what what's kind of going on in the U.S. stock market. And these are essentially lists of companies. So you've heard of, you know, the, the Dow Jones, the S&P 500. These are indexes. Um, the S&P 500 is for example, a list compiled by an organization called Standard and Poor's, and it's a list of the 500 largest companies, public companies in the United States listed on uh, stock exchanges in the U.S. based on their size. And so if you take the S&P 500, it's the 500 biggest companies, and that basically acts as a stand-in for the overall American economy. And so if you're looking to invest into one market or another area and you don't want to necessarily choose, you know, winners and losers, you just want to invest in the entire thing, an index fund is an effective way to do that because an index fund essentially invests in the entire index. Nobody else separate from the fund is going off and, and creating you know, all the companies perfect for investment. Somebody else is creating what the index is, the S&P 500. S&P makes the list of the 500 companies, but then the index fund, assuming it's using the S&P 500, for example, as one index fund, an S&P 500 index fund would then simply take all of the money and buy all of the shares of those 500 largest companies by a selection. Um, of shares from the 500 largest companies. So they would have all 500 in their index fund. And so you would know investing into an S&P 500 index fund that you're investing in all of the 500 biggest companies. And so whatever's going on with them will impact you, but it's really a stand in for investing in the entire US economy. They are Canadian index funds, there are different industry specific index funds there's index funds for europe uh, japan and a variety of other areas and index funds allow you to kind of invest in an economy as opposed to in is you know saying okay i want to invest in tesla and apple and, and something else it's kind of it gives you a, a wide shot a lot of breadth when it comes to your investment i see and and mutual funds the example you were giving before was mutual funds can invest in obviously in index funds as part of their portfolio. Mutual funds is just such a huge category. A mutual fund could be an index fund, so a mutual fund could be set up where it is a where it is an index fund. So the in the terms of the mutual fund, all it does is invest into for example, the S&P 500, whatever the index is, you could also have a fund of funds. So that's a mutual fund that invests in multiple different funds that invests in several different index funds. I would like to use mutual funds kind of as a categorizing term. Like if we use the term car or truck, we can use sort of mutual fund as a similar sort of category. So Tons of funds will fall under the category of mutual fund. Index fund is one of those types of funds. Thanks for thanks for clarifying. So I think you mentioned the word before, but what is an ETF? ETF stands for exchange traded fund. When we were initially talking about mutual funds, we talked about having to go into the bank and talk to a mutual fund dealer. Uh, so these are individuals who are licensed to buy and sell mutual funds on your behalf because you as an investor can't go and buy mutual funds directly. So an ETF is the first opportunity where investors can actually buy and sell funds themselves. These are funds that are traded on an exchange just like stocks. So you could go with your self-directed investing app and actually choose funds that you want to invest in yourself. Many of the ETFs are going to be index funds. Essentially, an ETF is a mutual fund that you, because it's publicly traded, are able to buy and sell on your own, as opposed to having to go through a mutual fund dealer. I also want to add a bit of a description for something called a robo-advisor. A robo-advisor um, is basically a financial advisor that uses sort of an algorithm or a set of instructions to help determine 
what investment makes sense for you based on general uh, sort of recommendations in the investing space. So rather than you speaking to a person like like Ryan or like myself and, and saying, hey, you know, what should I be investing in? The, you basically put in some parameters into the robo-advisor and the robo-advisor says, you know, I'm going to pick a mix of funds or, or investments that I think make sense for you. Now, why I mention robo-advisors is with something like an index fund, where the 500 companies on the S&P 500 are all known clearly in advance, they're chosen by Standard & Poor's, you don't really need to pay a fund manager to pick companies to invest in because it just invests in the S&P 500 and that's it, it just sits. If you tie that together with the idea of an exchange traded fund where you as an investor sort of self-directed can buy or sell the exchange traded fund sort of any time, you kind of remove the need to pay the mutual fund dealer and the fund manager. So you've reduced the cost of sort of just running and having this fund exist it becomes cheaper for the investor. So hopefully more of the returns can pass on to the investor themselves. The final step on this in the sort of reduce the cost puzzle is introducing the robo advisor. So this would be, okay, you put your, your goals for investing and your timeline and everything like that into the robo advisor. And it basically says, okay, you know, you want to invest over 20 years, you have a medium risk exposure. I'm recommending that you put, you know, 60% of it or 70% of it into stocks. And I'm going to basically put all 70% of that really into a few index funds that are probably also exchange traded funds like an S&P 500 ETF or, or something like that. If you as an investor are looking to invest passively and you're just looking to invest overall into the stock market and you don't necessarily want to be picking and choosing winners and losers and you just want to make sure that your costs are as low as possible and you are getting the maximum amount of returns probably the cheapest way to do that is buy a bunch of ETFs for you know the S&P 500 or in several other index funds that really just give you uh, a range across the market. Now, this, of course, isn't individualized investment advice. So if you want individualized investment advice, you can reach out to, to myself or Ryan directly, or you can reach out to your own financial advisor for that. But if you're looking for a sort of a standard recommendation of a, a good passive investment starting place, really the S&P 500 or another large sort of index fund covering the, the North American or the U.S. economy, you just kind of set it and forget it. That's proven over the past number of years to be uh, a pretty consistent space over the long term. Excellent. And and being honest, you know, a lot of mutual fund advisors or financial advisors from the big banks, they use similar calculators already when determining what mutual funds to select for you. So they ask you, do you want to balanced or a growth portfolio. And then they ask about your time horizon and they put it into a bank bill calculator. Is that is that not true? Yeah. So I haven't operated as a, I'm not licensed as a mutual fund dealer and I haven't been a financial advisor at a bank. I have worked in a bank. I, I have studied personal finance and I am a licensed dealing representative for an exempt market dealer, which is a, basically a financial advisor for private investments. Typically, um, when looking at investment choices, speaking to a financial advisor, you know, the financial advisor may be uh, limited to the types of funds that they can offer you to those funds that are offered by the institution that they're working for. Um, you know, I'm not sure if this is correct at the moment, but I know for certain members of the large five Canadian banks, the mutual fund dealers, the financial advisors at the banks are only allowed to offer funds from that same bank. So you can't go into bank A and buy funds from bank B. They will only sell the funds from the existing portfolio of funds offered by that bank. So you're kind of limited to that selection. And then the, the advisor is going to be using sort of a, a standardized recommendation 
which which most would use based on sort of the teachings of you know how to become a financial advisor and it's going to say okay if somebody wants low risk then you invest in really big companies or you invest in bonds and you don't go into emerging markets if someone wants higher potential returns higher risk then you're going to go into maybe some emerging markets more equity than debt and maybe some slightly smaller companies uh, which would be small cap as opposed to large cap large cap being big companies mid cap being medium companies small cap being small companies so all of these different decisions are in general pretty standardized the more potential return you want you typically look for higher risk companies you can't have high returns without high risk for example you want low risk you're gonna have low returns you want high high returns you're gonna get high risk there's not really any other way around that and so if you're looking for higher returns it's usually going to be smaller companies in emerging markets and you're going to be buying equity if you want lower risk it's going to be bigger companies in more established markets and it's going to be more debt and that's sort of typically the spread is going to be sort of something in that kind of direction, certainly with public investments. That's actually why we created Equivesto, because there's a bit of a limit in the top end returns that's possible from public companies uh, and available through you know mutual fund investor advisors. You're not really going to get really higher risk uh, investment opportunities that are going to offer higher returns, you're kind of stuck in the sort of low to medium risk overall category. And a lot of higher net worth investors are making use of private markets and private investments to get some of that higher risk, but higher return exposure in their portfolio, which for a very long time, the general public wasn't being offered. Even, you know, Wealth Simple and, and some of the larger banks have started adding you know, venture capital funds or private funds to their list of options because they've seen the trend of people wanting to get access to those. And we've been a part of helping make those private investments accessible to Canadians. Okay. So why in general do people invest in funds? So people would invest in funds for a variety of reasons. If you have a limited amount of money or you want to just have your money go further from a diversification perspective, you, know, you want to be able to invest in a thousand companies or 10,000 companies so that even if one or two of them aren't successful or 500 of them aren't successful, you've got 9,500 others that are being successful and, and, and buoying you along. Uh, diversification is a great option. Another is expertise. As an individual, if you haven't studied a bunch of finance, you're not necessarily going to have a huge wealth of information information about which companies are the right ones or the wrong ones at any one given time. You'll have companies that you've maybe heard about or you are interested in as a consumer. Those might be good options to invest in, but they might not fit exactly what your goals and objectives are. And so working with uh, a mutual fund where there is a fund manager that allows you to kind of say, okay, this person's going to be within the parameters of the fund, hopefully going and choosing the right investments for that fund for me. And if you're looking for something a little bit more, set it and forget it. And so if you want, for example, exposure just to the U.S. economy and you don't want to have to come and check on what your fund is doing and maybe you need to sell and put into another fund, you basically just want to say, okay, I'm putting it here. I'm putting it in the U.S. economy, in the S&P 500, and it's just going to go off and do its thing for, you know, five, 10 years. That, you know, Index funds and specifically ETFs that are index funds in the S&P 500 is a very cost effective way to do that. So there's a number of different benefits to, to choosing a fund as an investor. Of course, they come with costs. You're going to be paying fund management fees um, when you're investing in a fund kind of no matter what. And you may also be paying uh, you know mutual fund dealer advisor fees as well. So you just want to keep in mind you know, you're paying for this service, no service is free, but you can look at, okay, do you want a sort of a lot of human involvement, a lot of touch, uh, engagement, so you want to pay higher fees, or maybe you want set it, forget it, focus on reducing the fees, and then you'd go ETF. So what is the difference between public and private funds? 
I think this is a very, very important question, certainly for people who are considering investments on Equivesto. While funds are the same structure that we sort of talked about where you're you're investing in as a limited partner and there's somebody who's basically taking your money and managing it, with a public fund, this is a fund that's publicly available through one of the stock markets, and it's typically sold by a mutual fund dealer. It's regulated as a publicly accessible fund, and it's going to have open-ended redemptions. This is very important. Uh, so you, as the person investing into the fund, can get your money out basically within you know a week or so of investing. Anytime you want to take your money out, you can. Also, public funds, because they're targeting the general public, are more limited in the types of investments they can make. They're not typically going out and doing really crazy sort of derivative-based, high-risk, high-return, interesting financial product investments, and they're typically not going out investing in, you know, crazy higher-risk new companies or, or sort of anything strange like that. They're typically investing in kind of the the sort of meat and potatoes, bread and butter of investment stocks, bonds, public companies. Private funds are still structured as a fund, so it's a general partner, limited partnership, but they're not set up and regulated like public funds are. Most importantly, there isn't necessarily going to be that same ease of redemption. That's the biggest thing to think about for private investments. You're locked in most likely for a medium to long amount of time. So instead of you being able to go and sell, you know, next week because you need the money back out because you've decided, you know, you want to invest in something else or you want to buy a house or you want to do something else with private investments and private funds as well, you're typically locked in for, you know, at least three, if not five years. Uh, most private funds are around about five years in, in their time uh, that they're that they're operating for. Some of them might be longer lasting or what's called evergreen. So they might be around for a hundred years and then they would have the ability for you to redeem the units from them. But typically there might be uh, redemption penalties or costs for redeeming sooner than five years. So when you think private fund, the safest option is to, of course, read the documentation and confirm the length. But an easy assumption is, okay, five years. So one, they're longer term and you can't get your money out as easily. And then two, there's basically no limits set by the government around what the fund can do. So the, the only limits on what the fund is doing are going to be the limits written into the creation documents of the fund itself, the limited partnership agreement. That document is going to be extremely important. And that is really going to say what the fund can and cannot do. Now, there's a whole number of private funds and, and different types of investments that private funds can make that public funds cannot. Maybe we'll go into some of those, but there is a lot more opportunity for them to make higher return potential investment decisions that also come with higher risk. So uh, private funds are lower regulation, uh, but still regulated in, in a number of ways, but lower sort of regulation, so higher potential risk involved there. And uh, there's going to be a longer amount of time that you're locked in for. Certain private funds will follow different sets of rules. So if the fund is raising under something called an offering memorandum, you're going to get this if you want basically a hundred page document that says everything that you would need to know about the fund, the fund is going to have to report uh, and provide uh, sort of updates to you as the investor, as well as to the regulator on an annual basis. And the fund is going to have to have audited financial statements, which it provides to you and the regulator on an annual basis. That's for funds that have an offering memorandum. Now, some private funds don't use the offering memorandum uh, legal framework, and they just raise standalone sort of as they are. And so they are not even going to have to provide audited financial statements necessarily. It depends on what the fund managers choose to do. So 
by being a private fund, you're not required to do all these sort of things unless you choose to use that offering memorandum framework where then audited annual financial statements are required as well as that document called the offering memorandum. Uh, what are some common types of private funds? So there's a few different types of private funds. Uh, typically, private funds are going to be focused on the types of investments that public funds cannot make. Some names that you've probably heard of with regards to private funds would be a hedge fund, maybe a venture capital or VC fund, maybe a, a REIT or, or a private real estate fund. So those are some different names associated with, with private funds that you may have heard of. Let's talk about hedge funds for a second. Now, this is going to be highly, highly general. Um, you could go and research more into hedge funds if you, if you like. Essentially, hedge funds are typically still public-related funds, but the hedge fund is investing into public investments using derivatives or short selling or strategies that are typically not allowed for other public mutual funds. And the idea is really these sort of more aggressive strategies can allow the hedge fund to potentially make higher returns or minimize losses in a, in a downturn or, or do sort of more aggressive investment choices than would otherwise be available to a public fund. There's actually seven different hedge fund investing strategies that, that funds typically pick from. You can go kind of research that more on your own if you'd like, but you can think of hedge funds generally as public investments still, but usually with using all sorts of interesting and complicated investment vehicles and derivatives and, and all sorts of stuff like that. A subtype of a hedge fund would be something called a quant fund, potentially. So quant funds would use, you know, really intense computational algorithms to be making investment choices sort of beyond just humans. So it's basically like a machine driven investment, but with a very sort of complicated computer that's making investments very rapidly. Um, that could be an example uh, of a hedge fund, a sort of subtype being quant funds. Now, some other Examples of private funds, of course, is a private equity fund. Essentially, they're investing into private companies that aren't yet public. Typically, uh, if you think about a company, it's created, it starts out private, and it grows and grows and grows and grows, and then eventually it gets big enough to go public. Now, most companies do most of their growing before they go public. They keep growing once they're public, but that journey from inception to going public is where the most growth is. Now, it's when the company is most likely to fail and there's the highest risk. But during that growth cycle, that's where the largest potential returns for the owners are. So private equity funds typically invest in the ownership of private companies. There are a few different types of private equity funds, but typically private equity funds are the last stage of private investing before a company might go public. So private equity funds are typically looking for much larger private companies that are doing well. And private equity funds will either invest in private companies right before they go public. So they'll be the final investor in, help them get ready and then take them public. Or some private equity funds will basically buy and operate the companies that they purchase. So rather than investing in a company to help it go public and then they get the money out when it's public, some companies will just buy out all of the other shareholders. They'll buy the company outright and they'll just run the company and try to make it more efficient. Private equity funds in this nature are, are known in, in the sort of public media space as, as sometimes, and not necessarily correctly, as being you know, vultures. So the idea is they come in, they buy this business that's been run by you know, the, the small business founder for his whole life, he you know, did a great job. Private equity fund comes in, buys it. So that's great, the founder gets to leave, he gets a nice payday, and then they're like, okay, you've got 25%, too many employees, so we're gonna fire all these people, and we're gonna really change the recipe of how the business operates to squeeze even more profit out of it.
that's kind of how they're portrayed a little bit in the media. That's not necessarily the case at all. Um, you know, every fund is different, uh, but typically they'll just buy and operate companies with the goal of operating them a bit more successfully or finding ways that they can work with other companies in their existing portfolio of companies to have, you know, cost effective synergies or, or just work really well together. Another example of a private fund would be a venture capital fund. So venture capital funds invest in businesses just like private equity funds do. But they invest at an even earlier stage. So if you think about the private equity fund investing, you know, in the last couple of years before a company is going to go public, a venture capital fund will have invested several years before that. So the venture capital funds are investing, you know, when the company's only been operating for a couple of years, they've started to generate some stronger revenues, but they're, they're still very early and they have many years of growth before they can actually be thinking about going public. So venture capital funds are going to be, you know, higher risk than even the private equity fund because they're going even earlier stage. So you've got the sort of company being created, then you have individual angel investors that are investing, which are just higher net worth individuals who invest their own money early stage into a company. And then you're gonna have typically the venture capital funds start coming in. And then as the company gets larger and larger, then the private equity funds will come in. And then the company could either be sold to a different private equity fund that buys it ent entirely, or they can go public and now they're listed on a stock market and then mutual funds can become owners of them. So that's kind of the different steps through some of the private funds. Awesome. And if you could quickly cover what a real estate fund is. Yeah, perfect. A real estate fund is uh, is essentially a, a private fund that's really focused on real estate investing. There's a few different types of real estate funds. You know, one one example of a real estate fund is a REIT, uh, Real Estate Investment Trust, uh, essentially with a, a REIT, or, or it could be Real Estate Income Trust, depending on which definition you're using. The idea with a REIT is essentially, okay, this is a, a real estate fund. It's gathering up all the money. What's it going to do? It's going to buy a bunch of buildings and then it's going to rent those buildings out and you will earn the money from the people paying the rent to the building. You own a bunch of buildings, people rent the buildings out, whether that's commercial like business real estate or uh, individual residential real estate. You rent out the buildings and then people pay the rent and then that is your return as the investor. So you're essentially, uh, you and the other pool of investors are all landlords of hundreds of buildings uh, around a region and you're earning some returns there. Another example of a real estate fund, a little bit different to that <clears throat> would be a development fund. So for a development fund, they're not buying existing buildings that already exist. They're saying, okay, here's a big piece of flat land. We're gonna pay somebody to build a building there that doesn't exist. And then when the building is done, we're going to sell it, or we're going to build a bunch of houses and then sell those houses to homeowners, or we're going to build a condo or something like that. So with a REIT, typically the REIT is going to have some sort of redemption clause and will be evergreen. I mentioned this earlier, but an evergreen fund is essentially a fund that's existing for a long time. It's going to exist for a hundred years and it's just going to sort of keep on operating. It's going to sit there People are going to invest in it. It's going to buy properties with the money that's invested. And then it's going to pay, you know, money that comes in as, as cash flows from people paying their rent. It's going to pay that money out to investors. If somebody wants to take their money out, hopefully there's enough cash that's been kind of saved up. They can pay them out. But worst comes to worst, they sell a building and use that to pay out the investors who want to leave and redeem. But the fund just kind of keeps running. With a development fund, a development fund typically has a certain number of years because that's how long it's going to take for the building to be built. The idea is, okay, I'm investing now. I'm going to earn no returns for a while. The fund is going to take my money and pay a bunch of builders to build these houses. So the money's going to get spent over a five-year period, maybe six years or however long. And then at the end of that time, all the houses are finished and they're all sold off. And then you get a really big paycheck at the end when they're all sold and you get 
basically all that big returns that you didn't get for five years, you get them all in one nice big lump sum at the end. And so they're both real estate funds, but they're two very, very different options for how you might want to be investing. There's another option of a real estate fund, which would be a real estate sort of debt fund. So in this scenario, there might be other building properties or something that are like a development fund and they're three quarters of the way through, but they need a loan. And so you could provide a, a secured loan uh, temporarily to those builders who, who need a bit of money short term. There's, there's a sort of few other options which are a bit more nuanced, but from a very high level perspective, a good way to think about it is, okay, you've got a REIT. So it's a, they're buying existing buildings and renting them out. Your other option would be a development fund where they're, there's no building that exists. And then they, you're putting your money together to build the building and then sell it. Another option uh, for a real estate fund would be um, a, a sort of market fund. So the idea here is uh, this fund is looking at a real estate market where the, the value of the property is sort of going up. And so they're going to buy a property, they're going to rent it out. Um, but really where they're hoping the return is going to be is when they sell the property at the end, they're hoping that the, the market demand is going to increase and then the value of the house is going up. This uh, empirically is a slightly more risky investment because with a REIT option, they're buying the building and the building is generating high enough rent that it can sort of pay for itself, pay for a mortgage and pay out returns to investors. So it can just kind of keep operating as it is for a very long time. With the development fund, it's higher risk, but they're building the building itself. So it's going to really ramp up in value. They know they're creating value because they're building the building there. With um, you know, uh, the, the market fund, they're buying buildings that are already built. Maybe they're renovating them to try to sort of raise the rent, but the rent is really being seen as something to cover costs to help them elongate the amount of time they can own the building for. But before they sell it. The challenge here is the returns are entirely dependent on the overall market of the real estate space. They're buying the property with the aim to sell it, thinking that the value of the property is going to go up dramatically because of external demand, something outside what the fund is doing. And it can work. And you know, there's certain markets where real estate is very, very hot. And so that's that's proven to generate a lot of returns for people. This does create additional risk, however, because if the market changes through no adverse action of the fund managers themselves and the value of the properties go down, there's no way that they can make a sort of good return on the investments that they've made into those properties. So it is a bit more dangerous to invest into a real estate fund where they're basically the, the rent is just going to kind of cover costs and they're really hoping for the value of the property to go up and then they can sell that later and that's going to generate the bulk of returns. That's a, a, a riskier option in the real estate fund space. Okay, thank you. I think we're going to wrap up there for today um, and tune in next time for part two. Thanks for joining us. Thanks.